Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Two Fat Lardies Christmas Podcast. Please welcome your host, Mr. Sidney Ramworth. We're back in the Lard Island studio talking to the Fred and Barney of Wargaming, Rich and Nick. Chaps, welcome to the Oddcast. Yabba dabba do. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, Sydney. Hello, guys. How are things on Lard Island? Wet. (laughs) And warm. (laughs) And festive. Wet, warm and festive. And I saw yeah. some Christmas decorations. You did, yeah. On the arrival of the I've Great got, Hall. So I, I've got my baubles on display, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> fetching Santa hats as well. <laughs> Very glittery they are too. That's what we like to see. You can always see your face things. in them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was polishing money this morning. Well, <laughs> with that in mind, we'll t- tiptoe around these mounds of presents and glitter. Yeah. And, um, There's one for you here somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure there is. There often is. Let's walk a path that we haven't taken for a while and head across to the Lard Island Workshop and let's just oh, see what yes. you've all been up to. Uh-huh. Ooh. Okay. So here we are in the Lard Island workshop. There is a lot of work going on here. I can see, I mean, there's piles of books, there's figures, there's everything. What on earth have you been up to, guys? Rich, I mean, let's just put that hacksaw down and those wrappings of presents and bows and ribbons. What are you doing, Rich? I'm doing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's rather fetching. (laughs) (laughs) I like to look my best at Christmas, Sydney. (laughs) And and besides, and besides your new hair effect, which is most wonderful, um, what have you actually been doing hobby-wise? Oh, well, um, limbering up, really, for the next project by spending large amounts of money and throwing the boxes in the corner. Because... Uh, whilst we uh, are looking to be producing some pint-sized campaigns um, for the 1940 uh, handbook, what we're also doing, once we've got the uh, 2018 Lard Annual out the way, um, I'm going to be building some terrain and painting some figures for the Far East, Ah. which is going to be the next handbook that we're going to start working on. And obviously... I need to be ready with figures and toys to get play testing that. So uh, my uh, big Christmas project is going to be a, a jungle build. It's something I've always fancied doing. Mm. And over the years, I've bought a lot of aquarium plants, you know, the plastic ones, yeah. with a view of doing it. But I've never got around to it. So armed with a whole pile of MDF, a jigsaw, and a um, uh, load of plastic aquarium plants, I'm hoping over Christmas to build a jungle and I've been very inspired by what John Bond has been doing down in Australia in preparation for the big chain of command Far East event uh, at CanCon in Canberra. It looks sensational the photos that are on I think they're on the chain of command (coughs) Facebook group. They are they're on chain of command Facebook group and chain of command Australia Facebook group they're absolutely fabulous it really is one of those you know I I think I Mm. aren't I replied to him you know if, if he went up to any other jungle game he could go that's not a jungle, this is a jungle, <laughs> and whip out his massive jungle. It's a crocodile dungeon. It's a, it's, a, it's a crocodile bond jungle, it really is. It, they do look fantastic, those photos. They and, certainly uh, do. How have you been finding, building all this stuff, Mark? I see you, you're mm. well into all of this stuff already. Well, not really, that's actually just piles of stuff that I've, I've been trying to sort <laughs> out. Uh, it looks very jungly, but it is literally just a huge pile of plastic at the moment. I've got to make the bases, what I want to do is make the bases and actually drill in because a lot of things like these palm trees you can yeah. see here have got a little plug in the end uh, not three pin just one pin mm. and I want to drill that in to make sure the whole thing's really rigid because I have made jungle before for Vietnam where I've stuck stuff on with a hot glue gun and and it comes off yeah. with alarming regularity so this time I am going to I am going to try my 
try my best to make this fairly long lasting but um yeah it's um it's been fun buying all sorts of you know different different plants because i want i don't want it to just look like a jungle you know i do want areas of sort of banana plantations which you know are being tended by the local population or um you know things like rubber plantations yeah. um uh, which you know just add a little bit of difference to the table so yeah that's that's the big project i've been busy assembling and the question about jungle terrain is often how do you actually base it so that you can yeah. use figures on the table yeah. in, 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 a, in, yeah. a, in a way that's practical how, how are you going to do the basic have you thought well, about that? yeah i have actually i uh, funny enough i was also inspired by another um another uh australian gentleman who's got a blog called tactical painter and he um has has been running a pint-sized campaign um, based on um, Australian troops retreating in, uh, I think it's Singapore, mm. um, and uh, yeah. as as part of his basing, he actually mm. used um, herbs, you know, like those Schwartz herb pots, oh, yeah. where he sprinkled that yeah. on to show the sort of dead um, matter right. that's fallen down and dried up on the ground. Yeah, and I thought what better use for a bit of marjoram that's in the cupboard and you, and you haven't used you know, in 20 years. Yeah. So your Christmas turkey are going to be desolate. <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be nothing on there'll it. There'll be nothing there'll on be it. No, that's yeah. right. Not, no herbal content at all. The only thing will be available with a bit of sharp sand to sprinkle on top. Give it that kind of well-cooked look. That's right. It should, should be good, yeah. But yeah, so <laughs> it's, uh, I have given a lot of thought to that. Um, and one of the things I did when I made my pine forest for... Um, my northern European terrain was that I cut up some broom, bristles from a broom, mm. and scattered that over the base. Yeah. And it really gave me the effect that I wanted. It looked yeah. like that sort of pine forest floor with all the you know debris from years and years of pine needles dropping on it. And so it, it is important. The other thing practically you want to do is you want to make it an area that you can put figures on. Exactly, yeah. Well, and that's what yeah. John Bond seems to have done on yeah, the, yeah. looking, uh, you know, zooming in on the yeah. photos that he's done. Yeah. You don't need to move the terrain yeah. to move the figures. Yeah, it seems right. like you can move the figures around the three. It, it looks there. like it. I, I often find <coughs> there's a bit of a compromise there. Um, you know, if you can put figures on it, it doesn't look like there's enough foliage. If you put enough foliage, you can't put figures on it. Yeah. But it's trying to get the happy medium. And how successful I am at that will just have to be... Uh, mm. The proof of the pudding will be in the eating to, to be festive about it. It's really interesting mm. because I remember three or four years ago you mm. doing an Afghanistan build over the Christmas period. Oh, I did, yeah. And we've obviously sort of built various terrain for Europe. But it'll be yeah. interesting to see how you find the experience of designing a dense terrain table. Yeah. As opposed to a table, a table which is dominated by buildings like the Afghanistan, yeah, terrain, yeah. albeit with compounds and yeah, it's um, every project has its own differences. What I really intend to do is study the internet and yeah. steal other people's good ideas. Yeah. Um, and again, Tactical Painter made some fabulous paddy fields. I mean, I've made paddy fields in the past and they look bleeding awful. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> whereas <laughs> his stuff looks really good. So I'm I, I'm I'm going to be in, take my inspiration from people who are clearly uh, more uh, inspired than me and steal their ideas mm. and I'll then put them on my blog and pretend they're my ideas <laughs> well, I'm Alan Hughes look how clever I am <laughs> no, none of us have ever done that before. no, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> anyway so Nick how, how are you how are you set for the Christmas period with hobby wise uh, yeah good I've been investing in property I've been, as you know, you know, mm. taking my reserves and, and, and buying bricks and mortar, or MDF, <laughs> as it's otherwise known. Uh, I've, I've been uh, building on my collection of ham and jam. You know I use yeah, Jeff's, yeah. Jeff's lovely Normandy buildings. Yeah. Um, and he has recently um, released a church which, I'm not kidding you, is church-sized. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, you know, in, in terms of a table, it's a lovely, lovely centrepiece. Mm. Um, and it's going to be a beautiful centrepiece on, on a village table that we're working to create. And he's also done a factory unit. And I'm supplementing those, augmenting those, with some stuff from Charlie Foxtrot. Uh -huh. So I've been building lots mm. of beautiful terrains that Colin <coughs> Farrant, uh, mm. you know, shares and brings to the market. Uh, for instance, I made a stables block that he's done, which is a beautiful little model for yeah. keeping your horses in, if yeah. you want to do that. And um, he does a workshop, which I've um, 
I've got some photos for Twitter on, I've got some nice responses, uh, which is lovely. Um, just a nice little motor mechanics garage. A sergeant chef aubergine who's been returned to his, um, his village, having served for his country and he's set up his local garage to try and repair automobiles and it looks like a lovely little unit. Does so, look fabulous. Yeah, and some mm -hmm. things to go with Jess Factory. So using some, um, again, some Sarissa MDF factory mm -hmm. units mm -hmm. to go alongside Jeff Bond factory units to just bring the whole thing to life. So I'm going to have a, a little railway line that will go alongside his factory unit with a, mm. uh, with some water tanks and that kind of thing just to make it feel That's nice. real. And so yeah. I'm really looking forward to turning that table into something that we can play some games on and get some gaming yeah. in. We've talked about this before. It's about making the table look plausible, isn't it? It's mm. about creating a visual spectacle that allows you to suspend your disbelief and actually say, you know, feel like you are, you're there. And I know that sounds totally implausible, but, you know, a beautiful table is a thing of joy to play on. Yeah, I've been looking at pavements as well and how to do pavements. Or pavement in indeed. French. Indeed, yeah, quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, and seeing what I might do there as well. So all the small things, fences, walls, I've been doing my usual... Uh, Step turn sums, you know, around the workshop to see what we've got, mm. bits and pieces we've got lying around that I can make use of. I've been buying some Mantic terrain and doing some scatter, uh, yeah, so yeah. tables and benches so and nice. car yeah. wheels and barrels and all that kind of stuff. Step ladder. You did a step I ladder. Did a step ladder. Where did you get the so step the ladder? So the step ladder is from the Tamiya. It's right. a Tamiya German. They do a field maintenance kit. Oh. So it's German tank engineers. Uh, sort of right. Kitch, field kit, field. Not a field kitchen, field engineers unit. Just the sort of thing that you brain. need when you're uh, attacking so you've got of, isn't it? Really? Yeah. So you've got um, you've got ammunition, <laughs> you've got ammunition crates, toolboxes, all that kind of stuff. Climbing a step lovely. ladder to Kharkov. You could write a song about that. I think that's a classic song. Just waiting <laughs> to be written. <laughs> yeah. really? So, so the, the, figure, the figure painting's gone on the back burner while I've been doing that, and now of course we've got the annual, which we're. Um, you know, it's going to be a, a feast of lard, which is also yeah. uh, taking up lots of time. Yeah, very close, well. very mm. close, very close to fruition. <laughs> that, that is that is good, and uh, yeah. and how big is the annual? I mean, talking it's annual size. Annual size, it is. It <laughs> annual is. size, well, that's it excellent. Is. Although we're calling it an annual, but actually, it isn't an annual, is it, mate? It's Lard Magazine. Fantastic. That's yeah. a shame because we've been talking about the annual for some time. Well, it's an annual <laughs> publication, so in some right. ways okay. it is an annual, but it just isn't cool that. But it's gonna, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. That's we've gone fantastic. for a whole fresh new look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smart and sharp. Mm. The in crowd sound by Smart Sharp in crowd faces. Wow. That was the design brief. Don't they say that about women and hope as well? <laughs> it's the kind of thing that an upcoming young man about town, young yeah, wargamer yeah. about town, would be proud to be seen with. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, Esquire for wargamers type of thing. <laughs> well, that sounds absolutely you get terrific. a tweed blazer with yeah, the first, that's right. first one. I'll, I'll alert my tailor specially for the cover shoot. <laughs> No, we, we, won't, we won't be using you for the cover shoot, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry to let you know. <laughs> and, uh, don't we need to yeah. reverse the question, Sydney, to yeah. ask what activities you've been up Yeah, what, what nefarious yeah. tricks have you been up to? On the night in question? <laughs> oh, well, uh, since Antwerp, I've been pretty busy, actually. Um, uh, busy in the real world, but also busy in the hobby world. So I'm getting ready for an annual painting competition, which right. takes place, called the Analog <clears throat> Hobbies Painting Challenge. Yeah. And that's uh, run by a friend of the show and general friend, Kurt Campbell, over in uh, Saskatchewan in Canada. And there's 83 people taking part this year. And we spend three months sort of logging whatever painting we do in respect mm. of mm. the challenge. We get points for that. And it's a friendly competition. What do points make? Points, don't, points sometimes make prizes. And right. I think uh, we, Kurt's got a lot of sponsorship for this particular challenge. And right. I think that actually you guys will be sponsoring one of the prizes. Yes. Which is good. So yes. points do really make prizes. They One of the do. prizes will be done by you. It will. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be doing it later. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very friendly, very relaxed competition. Um, but you do have to sort of prepare a bit in advance and get mm. the figures already sort of prepared. and uh, Cheating, that's converted. cheating. No, it's not cheating. It's <laughs> not actually painting. You're just preparing, making the figures, converting the figures. So no. I've been doing that. Well, these are uh, French uh, for the late 17th century. I've done the Spanish, done the Flemish, and these are now French. So mm. that's the last bit of the jigsaw, really, for um, that particular period. And, and, and mm. to what extent do they look different, the French and the Spanish? 
Uh, they don't look hugely <laughs> different, I've got to say. I mean, the French are more are they, uniform. Are these, what what size are these? Are these? Uh, these are all 28mm. Uh, okay, right. How do you say. tell the difference? Is it the garlic? Yeah. Uh, the garlic does make a difference, <laughs> that's true. Uh, more, the bases, more ribbons on the French. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, oh. Christmas theme. Yeah. Yeah. And what about um, two mil? Have you done anything on the two mil? Not been doing much on the two mil for a while. Um, lots of people are. Is that because you can't find it? No, I can't perfectly <laughs> find it. They're all in a single box, so very <laughs> easy to find. Um, I need to... Uh, sort of get the games out of the club. Maybe in the new year we'll have some two mil games. I'm very keen on pressing forward with that. So I think that's scale's got a lot of potential. But since we um, did the demonstration and the participation game at parties, I haven't done a lot of two mil. But that's really for the new year, maybe. Mm. Anyway, so let's move away from the workshop and all our particular plans and designs, and I think wander back to the studio to see. The big issue that's waiting for oh, us. Oh, a big issue. Let's do that, Sid. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome back to the Sofa of Contemplation. Mm. As we know, when looking for what big issue to discuss, we like to look first to the post bag to see what the listeners are asking. So, I've had an email recently from Ned Sullivan from Rumagama in what I think is New South Wales, Australia. Ned put pen to paper and said... Sandpaper. (laughs) (laughs) Not on my baubles. (laughs) Ned took time off from the test match and said, me and my mates have recently discovered Chain of Command after several years playing World War II with Flames of War and then Bolt Action. Great game, guys. We just love the World War II feeling that we get, and the rules are on a roll down here at Els. One of the big things we love is the pint-sized campaigns and the way several games can go together to create something that's so much bigger. We love the way how each scenario is not always perfectly balanced. Sometimes I'll have the advantage, sometimes I'll be on the back foot. But over the whole campaign, there's a real balance. Can you tell me, guys, what do you think it takes to make a great scenario? How do you put them together and get the right feel? Well, Ned, thanks very much for that. That's a cracking question. <coughs> and, a ripper. Um, There's lots to a ripper. A corker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what do we think, guys? What is the secret to making a great scenario? In many ways, making a great scenario is all about thinking about what you want to achieve. What sort of game is it? Are you looking to play a fun game um, for, for example, like a Christmas game where you're looking to have lots of different factions, everybody's, you know, fighting a sort of king of the hill action, which, um, you know, can be the type of game that's very, very successful in a, in a, in a convention or show background. Um, you know, I've seen uh, think games like 55 Days in Peking, which many mm. UK gamers will remember, where you've got all the different legations in a way, having to work together to get the end goal, which is to defeat the boxers, but equally at the same time working individually to try and be the hero of the hour, so to speak. So there's there's games like that. On the other hand, you can have a historical uh, action which you're refighting, which is going to have completely different um, uh, imperatives to it, especially if you're trying to make it look and feel like the real action. In that case... Um, interesting point about balance. Uh, you you probably aren't going to be looking at having balanced forces of X number of points on each side, but you're looking at replicating the situation that actually happened. And what normally happens in most battles is that one side is attacking and the other side is defending. And normally the way that works is that the side who are attacking have got more blokes or more kit or more firepower than the side who are defending and it's that imbalance that actually creates the balance both sides have got equal chance of winning even though both sides are not equal Mm. Um, and I think one of the key issues uh, with with points based war games is that often they can lead to something of an on pass um, if both sides have got exactly the same uh, points values um, because it, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to attack an enemy who who you know is exactly the same strength as you. It then becomes a challenge on the table to try and achieve 
uh, overwhelming forces at, at a certain point, the whole Schwerpunkt principle. But that, that can be problematic. And I think one of the ways that we design many scenarios is actually by making them intentionally unbalanced. Mm. imbalanced mm. psychologically unbalanced maybe <laughs> or, uh, imbalanced in terms of points because we're trying to create um a situation where both parties have got a decent chance of winning and that doesn't mean equality uh, and that i think is an interesting point because the question is about what makes a great scenario and great scenarios mm. don't always make great games uh first time you run them out especially right. so many is the time actually where we've taken um historical scenarios yeah. or scenarios we've created you know on, yeah. based on plausibility and say you know what this is going to make a great game and you put it on the table and, and it doesn't make a great game first time round because mm. sort of, for whatever reason you haven't got that balance quite right or you haven't set the context of the game in the way that makes the players play it the way that you think in your head yeah. it's going to be played when you created the scenario so something it, it, it is the case that sometimes it's first time out is a uh, Oh, that's not quite right, and the second time out you have to balance it. I'm thinking most recently about mm. the Son Bridge scenario. Funnily enough, I was just thinking of exactly the same thing. We had a situation there where we walked the battlefield on our way up uh, to Arnhem, and uh, we all thought, wow, this is going to make a fabulous game. And we put the game on the table, and it made for a truly painful experience, a very <laughs> deeply unpleasant game. Um, however, what we did was we rethought it, and it didn't actually come down to changing the forces. It just came down to the way we positioned the table. So all we did there was change the orientation of the table. Yeah, absolutely. It, and and it, it really was as simple as that. Um, we, we shifted the table slightly. We'd had the bridge far too central by shifting the bridge to the top left-hand corner. It still becomes an objective, um, uh, but it becomes an objective that the Germans then have to fight their way across the table to get to, which, of course, because the bridge is central to the story, it doesn't mean it has to be central to the table. Yeah. It, it, interestingly, we played yeah. a follow-on scenario at the mm. club last night, mm. which was where the um, US paras um, were attacked once again, slightly mm. further south, I mean, by a matter of a few hundred yards, and the British sent some armour down to support them. So you get the scenario in which the US powers are supported by um, British tanks. Um, and what we did there was that what had happened was the Germans were attacking and the um, Americans with British support and the British tanks turn up counterattack. And in attempting to create that situation, we basically ended up with the Germans deploying at one end of the table and the Americans at the other side and just having a firefight across, mm. across the table, which was a truly blooming tedious scenario. Um, so what we what we came upon was the fact that don't do the German counterattack. Place the Germans on the table at their high water point yeah. where they have reached with their counterattack, and then start the game when the British tanks arrive, and that forces the U.S. powers then to try and drive the Germans off the table and clear the clear the, yeah. the ground. It made for a, a, a totally different game and much more historically. So, and I think the point you're hitting on there actually mm -hmm. is that it's all about timing. It's actually mm. taking that historical situation and the timing which you choose to kick it off is, is the key thing. I yeah. That's, that's mm. a key aspect, isn't it, really? Because sometimes I think historical scenarios, when you read about them in a book or campaign <coughs> summary, they're the sort of games that you instinctively are drawn to, but they don't always work the first time round. Mm. Having the experience to sort of think, well, the most obvious thing, like the bridge in the centre of the table, kind of doesn't always make a great game so mm. it's that experimentation mm. starting at different timing points turning mm. things around yeah in each of those points that you find attractive as regards a piece of history there's probably a great game um to yeah. make a great scenario yeah. out of that potential isn't always easy and there is a sort of uh, an element of trial and error i think back to the bow war games which mm. i think mm. still over the years back in 2010 2012 some of the best games we've ever played at the club. <coughs> and they were painful experiences, certainly for the British players. And, and yeah. we only had one Boa player on the Boa side, and the Boas yeah. were concealed. You're learning, aren't you, in that kind But of you're game. learning. Mm -hmm. You're learning. And the experiences that mm. as we developed those games, we changed the tables, we changed the orientation, and eventually the British players on the whole of the club learned how to do it. And I think that mm. is eventually a great game and a great scenario. But there is a sort of a learning process for a war game as well as 
a learning process on the table with historical counterparts. In many ways, that Boer War situation was interesting because it was the first real time in a wargaming scenario where it's a bit like a video game. You know when you first play Castle Wolfenstein that you've got to get through the you've got to get through the castle and out the other side and over the bridge, but you die in the in the in the lounge before you've you know even got a quarter of the way through it. But you know that if you keep going and learn from your mistakes, you are going to be able to commit complete that the, that mission for that level. And the interesting thing that happened in the Boer War was the British went through a learning curve from being where they where they were unsuccessful to a point where they became successful and that was replicated absolutely with the playing those games through and we actually did play the Boer War through in order right the way through from Talana Hill through to the relief of Ladysmith um you know looking specifically in the area of the Tugela River but the British went through exactly that same learning curve and as they played fresh games they got better at using the right tactics and the right um uh, the right formations for the task in hand, so that by the time Lady Smith was relieved, it was almost, and the Tugela River line was broken, it was almost though they'd gone through that learning curve and mm. gone from being rubbish to being good. Yeah. Um, and and that that is interesting. It's not necessarily what every war gamer wants, but it, it, it was a very interesting process to, to take part in and, and for me as umpire to observe. But it's uh, going back to your Wolfenstein mm. example as well. It's yeah. also about focus, isn't it? Which bit of this... Yeah, yeah. Of this, are you focused on right now? And that's mm. where um, mm. I think some really interesting depths of scenarios comes where you place them in the context of a campaign, or you do say, let's say for instance, you do a map based Krieg spiel, and then when you get to the point of contact, you turn that point of contact into a game that's played on the table. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you choose to zoom in at the right level to do the right mm. bit, you look at the right piece of action mm. at, the, at the relevant um, detail that enables you to actually enjoy and understand what you need to do to get that combat resolved and, and move on to the next thing. That's so it's, so in, it's, yeah. in that context, they can the scenario design falls part of a bigger, well, the word we often use is narrative, right? Yeah, that, that's a really good point, actually, because one of the things that I've always found when playing the traditional Prussian Kriegsbill, 1824, or the 1864 version, is that the map game that you were involved in normally is all about... Uh, outpost making contact, the inf imperfect information coming back to the commanders, then manoeuvring their armies to try and engage the enemy uh, with uh, superior strength. Uh, and it's how they go through those initial phases that is what the Kriegsbill is all about. And actually that Kriegsbill ends when you get to point of contact, which is the real battle mm. and the two mm. battle lines meeting. Because... Mm. The Kriegsbund is really, really good up to that point in analysing the big map picture of movement. But what it's not designed for really is refighting the battle. Because actually, often by the time battle is joined, it's you, you one side's got the jump on the other. So then that's yeah. the point where you could lift that and take it to a figure game using, yeah. you know, if we if we were doing Napoleonics, let's say the eighteen twenty four Kriegsbill, you could take that and and wheel out to General Darmé. Mm. Let's just sort of take that point mm. forward a little bit. I'm in, interested mm. in what you just mentioned about the endpoints of games. And that, to me, is always one of the key elements, going back to Ned's question, about mm. what makes a great scenario. Mm. Um, because I think timing and how long the game lasts mm. is often important in a scenario. The mm. campaign's a bit more open-ended. But the other thing that we might want to talk to, to Ned about is what is our condition for victory or determining who's won or lost um, what yeah. what place does a victory condition have in a scenario? I mean, we've all written scenarios. Mm. We've all identified in the scenarios we've written, all the pint-sized campaigns mm. that Ned mentions, we've all written the determinant of who is winning by the end. <coughs> How easy is it to identify that? Or is that something that war gamers mm. just instinctively feel by the end of the game they're either mm. winning or they're Ooh. losing? That's a good question. Do I think it build uh, to a climax, is it? Well, in a, in a campaign situation, you can have very, very different um, dynamics. You can have a very, very different determinant in terms of whether you won or lost. You know, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of campaigns online uh, which people are playing where, you know, their objective for the next game is set by the campaign situation rather than by the scenario. So, yes, I want to fight here to delay the Japanese for just long enough to 
buy time for the troops two tables away who were trying to you know put down mines and barbed wire or whatever that type of thing in that situation it doesn't really matter what the scenario brief is the important thing is playing that game within the context of the campaign you know you've got to hold on for a certain amount of time in order to achieve objectives mm. elsewhere which in a straight scenario you could say you know you've got to hold on here till the end of turn three or whatever but it wouldn't quite have the same um wouldn't quite have the same psychological impact if you weren't doing that as part of a campaign. Mm. Victory conditions, um, <clears throat> we see them a lot, don't we, in lots of games, and, and we've used them as well. I think they're, I think they're potentially a trap that you can get pulled into. Um, oh, huge. Because you know, very often you see a game where, okay, you could argue that the player has satisfied the victory condition. But you can look at this quite clearly and say, actually, that's a that's a complete nonsensical uh, situation. That you know, because mm. they happen to be sitting on that particular objective mm. that you set for them, therefore they've won, and I've I've won the race to the treasure. Um, but you can see in the wider context of the game that that just doesn't fit. It's it's, it's bizarre. So that, so mm. how you choose and set your victory conditions is really important for um, the way the game plays out. Because of course people will do what they need to do to satisfy that victory condition. And some players, of course, will do that uh, completely blinkered to anything else that's going on. They will just put troops in that farmyard or whatever, and they'll just keep it there, and that mm. just, be, just creates an absurdity. It, it, yeah, in, can, in, a, in, a tax, in an absurd situation <clears throat> where they wouldn't do that in real life. I mean, one of, one of the things that I always try and avoid... Um, is saying, you know, this is the time limit for the scenario. You've got to do it within X number of turns because that can be important in some situations. So if you've got engineers there who are trying to blow the bridge, the game will end at the point where um, they say, look, the bridge is ready for demolition, withdraw your men across it. If you successfully withdraw your men over it and they then blow the bridge up, well, that's it. And that is, it, it will take a certain amount of time to do that. The key important thing there is never... No, uh, never allowing the player to know it's precisely X number of turns that's going to take to do that mm. because you want him to be dealing with unquantifiable issues and having to, you know, he may make a guesstimate how long he's got to hold out, but the wheels might come off, things might go wrong, mm. you know, maybe, mm. you know, the, the, there's issues with the explosive. And the, so that is one of the biggest faults in scenarios saying you've got to achieve this by a certain point in time because a, a, a phase in chain of command is a matter of seconds mm. whether you take 20 phases or 40 phases it's irrelevant mm. because it's you've, you've achieved it within 10 or 15 minutes at the most it's often more linked to how much time the war gamers have actually got to stage the game itself well, that's true but i think what we yeah. what we're talking about is that getting too hooked up in respect to the mechanical aspects of a, of a victory objective in a scenario that that doesn't always work you know take the hill lay yeah. the bridge in a certain mm. amount of time so i think that you know what the great scenarios we've done over the years the one-off games they've often have an element of subjectivity you know those victory conditions change during the game or the umpire which we often play with an umpire mm. who sets up the game they'll say well something else is actually happening and you need to react to that so adding an element mm. which is unpredictable, mm. like in all things, just mm. adds additional challenges. Mm. Yeah. It stops that sort of chess-type play that, well, mm. I'm just going to sit there in the farmyard and defend that, irrespective of the fact that I'm now completely outflanked and the guns have been rolled up to batter down the walls of the farmhouse yeah. on the left-hand side. And, and create overlapping objectives, um, mm. you know, so that... So that um, I have to push against you to create mine. I have to push against your objective to... to yeah, I'm mine. creating yeah. a scenario, as, as we experienced last night, where one side lines up on a hedge on one side of the table and the other side lines up on a hedge on the other side of the table and they just shoot at each other. Is is the worst type of scenario in the world. You have to create within the within the scenario a reason for one side to get off its backside and get moving. You know, the rules are all about fire and movement. Don't just sit there and fire. Uh, you've got to create a scenario where people have got an imperative that makes them behave in in the in the correct manner. Yeah. I think that another way of looking at that is that you can have games which are firefights. I mean, think about a Napoleonic naval game, which oh, you know, yeah. you've got two lines of battle. Yeah. You can think about certain sort of hoplite mm. warfare, for instance, which is fairly mm. sort of symmetrical with similar yeah. forces. AC, American Civil War, ACW is another one. But within that parameter that you've got a relatively static battle line, 
there are other ways, and I think I liked your suggestion, that the overlapping objectives, that not every colonel, not every captain within those battle lines will necessarily have the same objective. Mm. You've got to have something to challenge the players. It's not just enough to line up your forces and meet in the middle of the table. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have something which focuses the players is to try and achieve something in the scenario which forces their for which forces their troops out of the comfort zone which the game creates. Yeah. So let's try and draw up a one, two, three point list. What makes a good scenario? Good terrain. Mm-hmm. Just thinking off the top of my head. You, um, you, you yeah, don't. Uh, if, if by terrain you mean the an appropriate table layout to yes, satisfy the game as a scenario, then That's yeah. Exactly what so I do mean. as in the Somme bridge, making sure the table yeah. is is angled yeah. in the right way to make sure that the right terrain comes yeah. into play yeah. to create the outcome. Yeah. To, to allow the game to progress in the way that it needs to progress. Mm. Yeah. I'd say a well crafted set of victory conditions or objectives, not mm. necessarily one potentially overlapping, potentially also different for different sides. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, asymmetrical objectives is often a very yeah. interesting way of doing things. Um, I, I also like the idea of putting in some uncertainty in there as well. So you may think that um, the game's about this and then discover mm. halfway through that actually it's about Which is, which something is in else. terms of what you do is you don't put a, a rigid timeline in. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to. I think also talking about the yeah. time, having an idea of how long the game is going to take in the real world. Yeah. You know, if you've got a club evening and it's four hours, mm. you want to be done by three and a half. Mm. You don't want a game in which it takes two hours no. for each side to get within shooting distance. And I think we've all played it. Well, those that's games. Uh, yeah, that's right, and that's one of the reasons why the the patrol phase is is such a time saver in chain of command just to avoid that thing where you line up on one side of the table and I line up on the other. And then at 9.30, we're just getting to the first point of contact, whilst at the same time we're thinking, hold on a minute, the pub shuts in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we we want to get it over and done with. But yeah, so... Um, I, I think also be prepared to... Be prepared to have your main objective not on the table. So, for instance, you know, an attack on a bridge. Attack on the bridge at Arnhem or whatever. You don't actually have to have the bridge at Arnhem on the table, no, right? Of it, you know the action. Often, when we think about these historical mm. actions, we think about them taking place at that mm. point. But yeah. often they take place mm. further up the road, or there's a key engagement that takes place further up the road. Mm. And actually, you can you fight that. So, f uh, I think for the scenario, it's focus on where you're going to get the most interesting game, mm. and that might be that might mean that your main terrain piece that you were thinking would be the game is not the game, and that can mean actually you have to let go of some arty farty desire to have a lovely looking bridge on the table and just leave that in the shed and just have bushes and trees yeah um the the, uh, the thing that is uh an interesting one and maybe a challenge from a, a scenario designer's perspective is making sure that the scenario briefing and objectives mean that the players are actually fighting the action that happened historically and i'm specifically talking about historical refights here because if you don't get the briefing right, they'll start doing something else. Yeah. Uh, unintended consequences and all that. Yeah. And you say, well, hold on a minute. You were meant to drive up the, you were meant to drive up the, the road and and attack and take the bridge, mm. but unfortunately, I didn't actually make that clear enough, and therefore you didn't do that. You did something else completely mm. different. And sometimes the what happened historically depends on them taking that option, and if they don't take that mm. option, then your scenario falls apart from that point on, yes, and, yeah. it, and it just. Well, that, again, dogs. that's exactly what happened the first time we played the Son Bridge game, is that mm. nobody took any bloody notice of a Son Bridge. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> a, that's a key distinction between a scenario, yeah. which is really focused, and a campaign which is more open-ended, yeah. and, and which can accommodate yeah. that yeah. sort of variation. So, still thinking about focus. Um, in a focused way, hopefully, Ned, that's answered your question, and that gives us time to Merry move Christmas, on. Merry Christmas, Ned. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Ned. That gives us... Time to move on to our next section as we move towards the Lard Island Library. So we're actually wandering past the Lard Island Library. My mistake, ladies and gentlemen, apologies. And yeah, instead, <laughs> instead, in yes. <laughs> well, indeed, because we're going to be moving towards the Grand Staircase into the Grand Hall, where off to our right is a fire blazing away in the heart. 
and the Christmas tree is glittering with a myriad of tiny lights and sparkling baubles. Because today is the chance when we get to open our festive gifts to each other. Ooh. Exciting. <laughs> what was in it? What was in it? <laughs> Don't rattle it too much. What do you do? <laughs> and the mulled wine is, uh, is uh, yeah, excellent. Very so. mulled. <laughs> Some more of that, please. <laughs> so, in the salubrious accommodation of the Great Hall, as opposed to the rather chilly library, we're going to give some presents to each other. Mm. Now, who's up first? Me, I want mine first. <laughs> I definitely no, no surprise there. I definitely want mine. <laughs> right, what you got? What you got for me? <laughs> uh, okay, well, Sydney, if you look under the tree there, yes, there should be a uh, not 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 that one. That's for you. Uh, but there is one, that other one there in the green paper. That's, uh, oh, all right, no, I've got it. I've got it. Green paper. That's the one. <laughs> You're supposed to take it off carefully. My daughter wrapped that for you. She took lots of time and put lots of... Right. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you A big book with crayons. <laughs> oh, no, no crayons. <laughs> right. That is Camp, a big book. It is a big book, and it's got pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Camp Group of Alpha and Panzer Brigade 107. Mm. Subtitle, A Thorn in the Side, that's all you ever were, of Market Garden. Well, intriguingly. So 107, of course, were the, the reason we saw 107. 107 yeah. were the guys who attacked on bridge. Woo, talk about continuity. Yeah. Wow. Well, this is a book Impressive. that I had heard about and uh, had actually put on my Christmas list. <laughs> well, uh, if you get to, if I'll I get, have the other one. Well, <laughs> if, if I do get to, I'm putting it on eBay because um, <laughs> this was produced at about <coughs> £60 pound, yes. uh, not long ago and they're already up to 250 quid on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is a spectacular book. Absolutely beautiful. This book tells the story of Camp Group Valtha and Panzer Brigade 107 and the first action on the 11th of September 1944 and they were annihilated not long after the fall of Arnhem. They fought through right the way through until I think October or November. So, uh, and I think they, they fought the Battle of Ogaloon, which is a really interesting battle. I'm also interested in having been to the Dutch, Armored, the Dutch World War II Museum there. So that Good is a fabulous present. Now, what else? What yeah, you got right. for me? Well, those are my boxes down there. Oh, give them a bit of a rattle. Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not a decanter and cut mouth, is it? But it was. <laughs> I have to put it back together. Right. Oh, hold on a minute. Oh. <laughs> oh. There we go. Ah, <laughs> ah, so. What's this then? What? What's this? Yeah, other way up. <laughs> <laughs> the other way up. Right, the other so way those up. Are buildings. It's bits buildings. of wood. Buildings ah. from Sarissa Precision. I thought it was some kindling at no, first. No, no, they <laughs> are for your far eastern terrain. They oh, are three lovely. houses from Sarissa, which I palm think, style. Well, you're into that, aren't you, I, Sid? I, I, I will see me under a palm, oh, a palm tree. <laughs> Uh, but these are palm style east right. and Europe, uh, e- far right. eastern houses in the right scale. The jungle. It's a jungle out there, but it, the get me out of a, here. A bit less of a jungle now with those buildings. Well, well absolutely. Insane, well, that's plank that right? style village house. Oh, Sydney. Wonderful. These are all perfect for my <laughs> for my new plan. So n- not only are we doing we doing nineteen forty four in the west, yeah. Yeah. Sydney's. Turning Japanese, I think he's turning Japanese. I've always been. I really Japan. think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we're going, we're going far east. Brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm a war gaming celebrity. Get me get some me jungle buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what can Excellent. I say? Hey, nice, that's 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 superb. Quick look. That's okay. Superb. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Pass the box well, over to Nick. Yeah. 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 They look good. So they look nice. Yeah. 
So it won't take long to do that, mate. Actually, the nice thing is no. I'm bored now. You, Come on, do, <laughs> more present. You have to think about whether or not you do the rooms in a different style or not. Oh, I will be doing. Right. I will be no, doing no, the rooms no, in a presents, non MDF no style. For you, not, you yeah. No, no, no. It's next more present. Next present. I've got, I've got a present now. I think, right. I think that one there is is uh, not right, the pink paper. That that's for Sydney. Yeah, this one here. Yeah. It's rather um, interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You can give the box a shake. Thank you. Can I? Yeah, yeah. It's not going to break. No. See if you can guess. It's, it's not more in the building. No, no, no. It's, okay, let's have a look. it's George Washington's wooden <laughs> teeth. <laughs> I don't I, I open my, my presents a bit more um, delicate, than you, so just open that and yeah. I have to tear along that. Oh, 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 now we're oh. talking. How interesting. Definite theme emerged. Yeah. Right, yeah. so uh, there's two aspects to this. So I've, I've just opened, um, look at that. I've just opened the... Uh, nice box. Whole, nice box. Holland 44 yeah. uh, board game by GMT Games. GMT. Which, funny enough, I saw a guy playing on uh, on, on Twitter well, uh, only the other day. So, so did I. Uh-huh. It inspired me. Yeah. I thought, who do I know who knows absolutely <laughs> nothing about what happened in Holland in 1944, despite me yeah. taking him all the way to yeah. Arnhem. And he still knows nothing. I thought, some, I thought it was some kind of comment on my on my map reading skills <laughs> that you've sent me, give me a box with a huge map of Holland. <laughs> yeah. Don't get lost again. Oh, I can, all that yeah. and here's the bush that I had a wee in. Yeah. <laughs> it's all there. Uh, so this looks like a cracking game, actually, because it is. Mm. So there's two aspects. Firstly, it scratches the itch of Market Garden, which is, yeah. as you know, something we've been really uh, fascinated by recently. Yeah. And secondly, we want to play more different style games, and ball games are a really good way. Um, uh, just um, seeing what else works, yeah. and, and uh, you also know I'm into big map based creature feely things at the mm. moment. Yeah. So uh, thanks, guy. That's going to be. Uh, we'll get that. Out Don't thank him. It's from me. Do you think my mother-in-law would like to play it? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> she's. She's. Uh, uh, well, at least you should win your first game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe she can punch out the cards for me. That would be uh, something for her to do while she's hanging upside down from the rafters. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Thank well, you very much. Well, and uh, Sydney. Well, there's, there's Whoa, mine down there. Is that for me? Is that's, it Lino? That's, that's not Lino. <laughs> is that for me? It's not Lino. You're joking. It's a cigar box battle match. It is. No, don't it tell is. him that. He's got to open it. <laughs> well, I can see it. He didn't wrap, wrap it. it. Look, he's got about as much wrapping on it as, uh, as Robinson Crusoe Tarzan. <laughs> right in wrapping a great big thing like that. Okay. No, but we'd well, struggle. Well, that's a huge one. So this yeah. is... Sid, you're trying to get me back if back in the boat again. Well, I did wonder because obviously rumours of Kiss Me Hard <laughs> too, and we were talking about small boat actions. We are, right yeah, yeah. Well, I'm and... just thinking, uh, I was funny enough, I was in my garage yesterday looking at how many 28mm ships I've got. Mm. And I've got six whoppers uh, that we should mm. do some something worthwhile with. Right. You know what to do with six big whoppers, wouldn't uh, you, Sid? Always. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, possibly more this than is modern, great. This is Navy. really good quality mm. as well. It's, it's going to be a fantastic map to play with. I think so. Excellent stuff. Yeah. And it means I can chuck out that old felt one that I've had for years. I thought you, yeah. so that's, that's I thought really you were talking good. about your missus for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> now, she was well thought? felt. <laughs> <laughs> this is superb. Thank you very much, Sydney. Really appreciate that. Lovely. Very kind. Good. Well, I feel like a real sport and boy. You're welcome. Thank you. So you should, mate. So, so should. what about uh, you, Sydney? Oh, uh, oh, yeah. You yeah. didn't get me we, a present, uh, did you? Oh, we did. Oh, yeah, uh, Lino, that pink one, but right. about 12 inches long. <laughs> interesting wrapping. Yeah. An unusual bow on it. But, uh, oh! <laughs> <laughs> press, press the button. Press the button. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, wow. <laughs> the speeds vary. That's useful. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's all right, mate. You can play with it when you get home. Have you got have you got one like that already? <laughs> um, not quite which fits that hole. Oh, pass it here. Different variable speeds, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And the top <laughs> wiggle. Yes, <laughs> yes. Watch your fingers on that. It's really, the buzz is quite... Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> now, put it yeah. away, it's Sydney's. Okay, well, thank actually, you. Well, thank you, Richard. This is nice interesting. We should, have, we should have spoken to each other before Sydney. Oh, no. Sydney. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, here we go, old chap. Another, another Merry one. Merry Christmas to you. In golden wrapping this time. To you and your kids. 
although don't oh. use it on them. Oh. <laughs> well, that does look very special. Fresh up. Remember that. That's a powerful one. That's a wonderful. One. Absolutely wonderful. Well, that's going to be a very happy Christmas day. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be able to prepare myself properly for my challenge with things like that. You 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 will. And actually, my mother-in-law might be interested. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. Well, I do sometimes wonder why I do this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Christmas here. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Christmas, here's guys. Here's here. yeah. Raise a new glass of mulled wine here. <laughs> and as the embers glow in the heart and we look towards a festive eggnog to recover <laughs> and round off our evening, yeah. I just have time to... Thank you. <laughs> time to thank Nick and Rich for joining me tonight. My thanks to you at home for listening throughout the year and to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a festive New Year. Uh, but, but, but what's this? It seems outside the Lard Island peasants are assembling, come from their meagre hovels to bring us their festive greetings at this special time of year. Come in, peasants! Oh, come in! Greetings! <laughs> Clearly, the gin ration Richard has been issuing has done wonders for their festive spirit. Peasants, peasants, please sing us out. Oh, <laughs> 